I uh, hope you all had a great 4th of July. Really hope you enjoyed that. Uh, one thing that's more beautiful than watching fireworks is watching your two-year-old grandson's face light up and his eyes bug out at the fireworks. Uh, that is just a joy. At first he's a little scared, but then he gets used to it and, and he's just you know, awing all the, the bright colors and stuff. And I, of course, told him, taught him that, that we are celebrating bright colors and loud booms, not celebrating violence or reenacting violence. And he got the point, so he's a good Anabaptist. But uh, that was a good 4th of July. And finally, this is our, our Pod Rishner shirt. Our creative arts team is so cool. So this is around the globe, all of our Pod Rishners. We love our Pod Rishners. In fact, let's say that. Uh, on, on three, say, we love you Pod Rishners. One, two, three. We love you Pod Rishners. All 20,000 of you, all around the globe. And so this was the t-shirt they made for uh, those who joined the Sustain campaign, uh, which was helping to support the church here. So that was a, a very cool thing. Now, we are in the series called Twisted Scripture. We're looking at scripture that we believe has gotten significantly twisted over time and trying to bring some clarity to stuff. The passage we're going to be looking at this morning and the topic that we're going to be talking about this morning, um, many of you probably wouldn't think has been twisted at all. If you are relatively new here to Wilderness Church, this message may come as quite a surprise, I dare say shock, and I just encourage you to keep an open mind and prayerfully consider things and weigh what I say. Um, it addresses what is possibly the most foundational aspect of Christian theology, and that is, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be saved? So the passage that I'm looking at here, and there's a, a several that are just like it in the New Testament, but it's Romans chapter 10, verses 9, and then I'll read also verses 12 and 13. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Seems clear enough. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is the Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For, and now he quotes the Old Testament, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What could possibly be twisted with that, you wonder? First, let's pray. Abba, Father, I... Thank you for every person in this auditorium and every person listening in, uh, through podcasts or any other means. And I pray blessing on them and just pray that your love envelops each and every one of them, envelop us as your presence is here. And I pray, Lord, that you, by the power of your spirit, infuse this word with authority that goes beyond what a human being have, has, because I have none. Uh, but Lord, use this word uh, to highlight the beauty and the awesome grandeur the transforming power of the good news. And free us, God, from misconceptions that have cheapened it and watered it down, made it something trivial. Uh, open our eyes to see the beauty of salvation, the beauty of the Lord who saves us, the beauty of, of, of what it is to be freed from all that holds us back. Have your way now, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You've probably encountered this in one way or another, or heard about this at least, where, you know, if, if, if on any February or March you go down to Daytona Beach or any beach in the south, or in Florida or in California, maybe even uh, uh, in Mexico, you'll, you'll, you're likely to find, come across some college kids uh, from college ministries, sincere, great college kids who, instead of taking their spring break to go party, they wanted to take it and go witnessing. And they do what they call canvassing. They, they just walk along the beaches and talk to people and try to get them saved. Uh, and what that usually consists of is, uh, if they meet someone who's not a believer, they'll try to convince them that they, like everybody else, is a sinner uh, and therefore is going to hell, unless you believe in Jesus. Uh, and if you will believe in Jesus, confess with your mouth, and, and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, meaning you won't go to hell. You won't suffer the wrath of, of God because Jesus suffered it in your place. And, and often they'll come back from these missions trips and they'll report that there were hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who were saved, who came to Christ through their beach canvassing. You find this a lot with uh, churches, uh, certain denominations, they publish 
their salvations every year. We had 800 or 8,000 people saved this year. And they mean by that, that in response to an altar call, some people came forward and they, they confessed with their lips and believed in their heart that Jesus was Lord and, and the Father raised him from the dead, and therefore they are saved. And you really get it a lot with uh, evangelists. Evangelists down to Latin America and, and over to India, and they'll report sometimes that there's 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people who were saved in, in, in a single revival meeting. And they publish those numbers, and, and everyone goes, yay, and, and sometimes that helps them get support. And I, neither I nor anyone else on the planet, are in a position to question those salvations. I, I don't know who's in and who's out. But I will say that there's something about that that concerns me a lot. Uh, there's something truncated about that version of what it is to be saved and how, how we become saved. Just believe it, assent, assent to it intellectually, say it, and bam, you've sealed the deal. Um, it goes right hand in hand with what we talked about last week, this penal substitution view of the, the, the atonement where the Father's wrath had to be poured out, so Jesus stepped in our place and he, he bore the, the judgment instead of us. It's this legal framework where theology is construed in this legal framework where God is the judge and, and we're the guilty defendant uh, deserving of eternal punishment and Jesus is our defense lawyer. He steps in and takes the punishment that we deserved. And if we will just believe that, if you just assent to that and say it, well then the deal applies to you. And now you're acquitted. And that means that you have got your post-mortem fire insurance. You, you, your afterlife insurance, that when you die, you'll go to heaven. But it leaves you completely unchanged. It's something that's done for you, but not something that's done in you. You get in on a legal transaction. And see, because this is construed as a legal deal, it leads to all the kind of questions that Christians, in the West at least, typically struggle with. Custody debate, like eternal security. They wonder, can this acquittal be revoked? Or is it an irrevocable acquittal? And if, it's, if it can be revoked, what are the conditions under which it can be revoked? What sins can I do and what sins can I do? What are the revocable sins, the sins that will cause it to be revoked? Is fornication one of them? Having sex before marriage. And if it is one of the things that could cause my acquittal to be revoked, um, well, what exactly is fornication? I mean, let's define it very clearly. Uh, is it first base or second base or, you know, just how far can I go before, boom, I lose my acquittal? And that makes perfect sense if you're talking legalities. If we're talking rules here, legal rules in a contract that I, I sign with a profession of faith, then, then I want to know the details, the fine print of the legalities. How much can I get away with before I lose my acquittal? And Christians you talk about this all the, all the time. And, and, and you look for the loopholes. That's what you do in, in legal deals. Uh, wh wh how can I get around some of these clauses? And it is amazing to me, I'll tell you, uh, the kind of creativity that is, is evidenced in some of the loopholes that people find. What exactly is sex? Whoa. It, <laughs> I'm going to stop there. Um, but it's, but that, that, that's, that is to be expected when you've got this legal framework. And at least to some interesting implications in people's lives. I mean, for the people who think it can't be revoked, their motivation for doing certain things and not doing other things and trying to get as close to the line as they can uh, is, is fear. Uh, they, they're motivated not by a passionate love of God, but by a, a fear that if I step on this landmine, well, then I'll get revoked, uh, but I, I'm okay over here. And so you're, you're just trying to do the do's and don't do the don'ts. And then for those folks who believe that it is irrevocable, who believe in eternal security, once you, once you profess it and once you believe it, boom, the deal is sealed and it can't be revoked. Well, pff, you've got your get out of jail for free card and life can be a party. I've shared this example. It's kind of extreme, but it's, it's interesting. I'll share it again. Um, when I was in grad school, I was uh, taking this trip to go to this one meeting and I was on the freeway for a couple hours. So I stopped at this truck stop and sat next to this very friendly, chatty fellow who almost immediately started to tell me about how great his life was, what a great gig he had going on. And he was telling me that back in his hometown of Virginia, uh, he's, he's shacking up with these two gals. Uh, it's their apartment, but he used to live there. And they're his girlfriends, and they don't even mind sharing him. Whoa, what a sweet deal. And he's a truck driver, and all the places he goes, at every one of his stops where he stays overnight, he's got a gal waiting for him. 
And he beds up with them. Every night he's got a different place to go. And one of these girls is so nice because uh, she has all this cocaine. She somehow knows somebody who's got, so he gets all this free cocaine. So he has got the gals and he's got the sex and he's got the cocaine and what a life he's living. I think he was trying to make me jealous. But then he asked me, uh, what do you do for a living? <laughs> And he about choked on his burger when I said, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor and I'm going to grad school. And, really? You know that part about that? Yeah, I was exaggerating a little bit there. No, but his response was really interesting because he said, he put his arm around me. He goes, well, I want you to know that I'm, I'm a brother in Christ too. I go, wonderful. Wonderful. And he says, I'm what you call a carnal Christian. I said, that sounds about right. Uh, I'm a carnal Christian. And so I said, can you flesh that out a little bit for me? Well, he goes, well, you know, I, 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 I accept Jesus as, as a Savior. I just don't accept him as Lord. Maybe someday I will, but right now I'm having too much fun. So he's my Savior, but not my Lord. And, and I said, oh, I, I didn't know he could be divided like that. Um, uh, tell me more about that. He goes, well, when I was four years old, my grandma took me to church, the Baptist church, and, and, and when they gave an altar call, I walked up the aisle, and, and she, she, she held me pray the sinner's prayer, and I, I believed in my heart and confessed with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my Savior, um, and, and, and so I'm saved, and, and I know that now, because of that, uh, because of this, this, this arrangement, God now doesn't see my sin. He looks at me through Jesus' spectacles. When he looks at me, he sees the blood of Jesus because I'm covered in the blood, so he doesn't even see my sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. I said, dude, that's quite a cloaking device you have. <laughs> that, that, that's something. Now, here's the thing. I, 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 we don't know people's hearts. Only God can judge the heart. And so I have nothing to say about whether he's actually saved or not. But on the other hand, you know, you, when the Bible says you'll know them by the fruit, it has to mean something. And we have all these passages about if you return to your formal way of life, like a dog returns to its vomit, um, that the latter state is worse than the first. And those warnings must mean something. And so I, since he believed in the Bible, apparently, I asked him, you know, what do you think about some of these verses? Do they concern you at all? Uh, he invited me in on his life, a little too much, actually. Uh, and, and so I, I felt I could share that much. But see, any theology, it makes, it makes sense. It makes sense if, in fact, Salvation is a legal deal, a contract, where if you will confess this and believe this, then you will get this. You purchase this fire insurance by doing these things. Well, then it makes sense that you would live like that, and he has this assurance that everything's okay when he dies. But I submit to you that there's something twisted in this. It really is not that different than what we find in all these polls that are done. Barna's done some of these, where uh, it, it, they found out that if you ask people what you believe, over 80% of Americans will say they believe in Jesus. They identify as Christian. But if you ask, what does that mean to you? What difference does it make in your life? The answer you'll get for the majority is nothing. Their beliefs, their, their, their value system, uh, their behaviors are exactly that of the surrounding culture. It makes no, so we have a lot of belief that makes absolutely no difference in, in people's lives. We think something has gotten twisted here. And if you do follow-up studies on all these mass conversions, um, you'll find that nine out of 10, five years later, nine out of 10 of those people who made decisions, their life is absolutely no different because of that decision. Something has gotten twisted here. There's something that is amiss. Now, I wanna raise three questions about this. I'll call it the contract legal view of salvation. A contract, you enter into this contract and you purchase your fire insurance by professing something and believing something, giving intellectual assent to something. First question is this, and we always gotta start with Jesus, right? Jesus is the center of everything. So you ask the question, how is this view of God in this legal arrangement thing, how is that consistent with the God that's revealed in Jesus Christ? For one thing, when you read the Gospels, you don't find ever Jesus really being concerned to get people to sign on the dotted line to purchase something for their afterlife. He never does that. In fact, he warns about the afterlife to the Pharisees uh, about the dangers of Gehenna, um, but he's, he's more interested in the road that people are on now because it's the road they're on that leads to that. That's the consequence. This is the road. And so he addresses people in the here and now. If you notice that Jesus is all about the here and now, dealing with real people in the here and now. 
Jesus, wherever he goes, he doesn't just try to get people to sign on the bottom line. No, he meets their needs. If, if they need healing, he brings healing. If they need deliverance, he brings deliverance. If they need food, he multiplies loaves and fishes. He meets people's need in the here and now. And sometimes he calls that salvation. He says, your faith has saved you. And he's talking about the wholeness that they got out of relationship with him. It's true that sometimes he says, do you believe in me? But he never considers that an end in and of itself. Like, oh, you do believe? Okay, now you can rest comfortably because you, you, you've taken care of the afterlife. He never does that. Faith is, is a prerequisite for them receiving the kind of healing and wholeness and deliverance that the kingdom brings. So it, it's, there, it's a matter of them, do you trust me to bring you to this? But it's never an end in and of itself. And he's never trying to get people to sign on the dotted line. He just meets their needs and then moves on. Not only that, but you have to ask this question. Would the God who became a human being and went to the cross and bore our judgment, uh, would that God who prayed with his last breath, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. The God is revealed on the cross. Would he leverage someone's eternal welfare on the intellectual content of their brain? On, do they assent to the right theology or do they believe wrong theology? Why are beliefs in and of themselves so important? It's like a, a, a theology professor on steroids where he'll flunk you eternally if you get a wrong answer. Why is God so interested in that? What is it about beliefs? Believe the right thing? You believe that, that this happened, then you're in? Believe the wrong thing, then you're out. It seems like a God who loves theological correctness more than he loves people. But he died on the cross for everybody, but he's going to disqualify them if the content in their head is wrong. And what if the person is, is totally sincere in their wrong beliefs? What if as these college kids are, are ministering you know, on the beaches, uh, one, one comes up to a non-believer, and this non-believer happens to be particularly sharp? and ask questions that the, event, this, the college kid can't answer. Like, why, why should I believe in Jesus uh, rather than Buddha? And the kid might say, well, because the Bible says so. Well, why should I believe the Bible? Well, because it's God's word. Why should I think it's God's word? I don't know, just do. <laughs> well, what if he's got good objections? Is he going to hell because he happened to bump into a, a less than fully bright uh, witnesser? As though if a more intelligent witnesser were to come along, maybe then he'd be in the kingdom. Would God leverage it on a contingency like that? So there's something off with this. And the other thing is, you got to ask this question. Is belief something you can just turn on or off? It, 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 can you just choose to believe something? Right now, I want you to believe in unicorns, all right? And Mark said, go. <laughs> no, you would need some evidence or something to convince you of that. If I, let's say that you don't believe that there's intelligent life out there uh, on, uh, in the universe, or, or on Earth for that matter. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes you got to wonder. But you, you, do you think that there's alien life out there? And it, suppose I come to you. you. You don't believe this, but I say, I tell you what, I'll give you $100 if you will believe it. In fact, if you say you don't believe it, then I'm going to take $100 from you. I'm going to steal $100. Can you just all of a sudden genuinely be convinced that there's intelligent life out there because I'm motivating you to believe that? You may say it because you want the $100, but can you really believe it? All of a sudden change your beliefs because someone's putting pressure on you to change th their beliefs. How is that different than, if you believe what I'm telling you to believe, you won't go to hell? Oh, okay, I guess, good argument. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll believe that. It doesn't work like that. And this is what I've never understood about the Middle Ages, the Inquisition and all of that. Um, Christians would put to death heretics, torture them, to get them to profess orthodoxy and renounce their heresy. Kelvin burned Michael Servetus at the stake. Uh, it took six hours because it was a windy day and the wood was green. Uh, terrible, terrible death. And it was all because Michael Servetus wouldn't say the word eternally begotten before the word son. He believed that Jesus was the son of God. He didn't think he was eternally begotten because he didn't see that in the Bible. Calvin thought that was worthy of death. And so he puts uh, uh, Michael Servetus, uh, he burns him alive. But the torture kept on saying, just say eternally begotten and we'll stop. Say eternally begotten. And Michael Servetus amazingly would go, no, 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 we're not going to do it. Just say eternally begotten son, and then we'll free you. And he would not renounce. It's amazing. Six hours of burning, and he wouldn't re recant. Now, suppose he had recanted after 20 minutes. Okay, 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 he's really bad. You convinced me. Good argument. Okay, I I'm with you. Would anyone believe him? Can you just decide to believe something because there's external motivation? There's something amiss with this idea that everything is leveraged on just believing a certain thing and professing a certain thing, and it doesn't strike me as consistent with the ministry of Jesus or the revelation of God that's given to us on the cross. Here's the second question I would ask. Why is it that in the New Testament you never find belief 
divorced from how we live. And you certainly never find Jesus as Savior divorced from Jesus as Lord. He's one person, and he's Savior and Lord. But they, they never distinguish between the two. Whereas in the contract view, it's a, there's a great distinction. You believe, now you're in, the deal is sealed, and how you live becomes at best secondary, maybe even irrelevant. The New Testament never does that. Salvation includes part of how we live. Now, we don't live a certain way to become saved, as though we earn it or achieve it, but when you're in on salvation, it changes how you live. So, for example, we find this in 1 John. He says, whoever says, I have come to know him, but does not obey his commands is a liar. What does that do with my truck stop friend? And in such a person, the truth does not exist. See, truth is something that's supposed to exist in us. Not just that we believe in our head, it's supposed to be in here. But whoever obeys his word truly in this person, the love of God has reached perfection. By this, we may be sure that we are in him. Here's how you know. Whoever says, I abide in him, ought to walk just as he walked. Amen. And over and over in the New Testament, we find a sense of urgency about following the example of Jesus. What he did for us, including what he did for us on the cross, isn't just something that's done for us, though it certainly is that, but it's also something that we're called to imitate. Live in love as Christ loved us and gave his life for us, Paul says in Ephesians 5. Um, and see, John talks in absolute language. He, 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 he uses black and white categories for emphasis. But he's not saying that if you, uh, you know, happen to have a bad day and you disobey one command, that, that means you're a complete liar, or that if you don't walk perfectly in the example of Jesus, that means you're not abiding in him. He's simply emphatically saying that abiding in Christ isn't some kind of a legal deal, it's a reality. And it's a reality that changes us. And knowing him isn't just about believing something about him, and professing something about him, it's about knowing him so that the truth is in you. And if the truth is in you, you're going to have an impulse towards the truth. You're going to have a motivation to be walking in the way that Jesus walked and living in obedience to his commands. Will you do it perfectly? No. Sometimes it's three steps forward, four steps backward. But there'll be, there'll be a sense there. You've got a different DNA in you, and so your life is gravitating in a different direction. What concerned me about this truck stop guy it wasn't so much the things he was doing, it's how okay he was with doing it. He was celebrating it. He was bragging on it. If he had said, oh, I struggle with this, you know, I've got conviction, well, that's a sign of life. That's a fruit. I was like, oh, you know, th that's a good thing. But he, was, he had total congruity with living this kind of debaucherous life he was living. If the truth is in us uh, and, and we're abiding in him, this is what salvation is all about, there'll be a change and it can take time. It take, it's about being transformed by the renewing of your mind and, and about learning to let go of things. But you're moving in a certain direction. It's about reality, not a legal fiction. Which leads to my third question. How is it that the New Testament talks about salvation in three, sense, three tenses, past, present, and future? Whereas if the legal contract view is true, it don't, you should only talk about it in the past, which is how most evangelicals talk about it. Were you saved? If, if the deal's done, it's done. It, you, you don't keep on being acquitted. And yet, the Bible, when it talks about salvation, uses all three senses. So we read, for example, in Ephesians, He has made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. That's past. He made us alive already. It is by grace you have been saved. So if you're surrendered to Christ, you have been saved. It's in the past. But now notice this. Paul also sometimes talks this way. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They're right now in the process of perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The cross is the power by which we are being saved. It's a present tense thing. We're in a pro it's a process. It, it's given to us once and for all. Right? There it is when, when we surrender. But now there's a process of being saved. Saved from sin. Saved from bondage. Saved from lies. Saved from deception. It's a process. And that process continues until it's completed. So sometimes salvation is spoken of in the future tense. Paul says this, for example, in Ephesians, uh, Romans 5. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? A future tense thing. Now, that makes no sense if you're talking about a legal contract. Either you bought the car or you didn't. You don't say, I'm in the process of buying the car, unless you're right now in the process of it. But once you buy the car, you won't still be in the process. You do it, and then it's done. That's how contracts work. You sign it, you do, give whatever you're supposed to give, you purchase whatever you purchase, boom, it's done. You're not in the process of it, and it's certainly not a future tense thing. But salvation in the New Testament is much more holistic. 
It's about reality. It's about life. It's about transformation. And it's an ongoing thing that would be completed here in the future. It tells us that something is seriously am amiss, been twisted with this legal concept of salvation. Now, here's the core problem. The core, the core issue here is this. We in the West tend to think in terms of contracts, whereas the Bible always thinks in terms of covenants. We think contractual legal categories. Our culture is all contractual. I mean, everybody's got their rights. That's why we talk about rights all the time. I've got my rights and the contracts protect my rights. We have a social contract and if you violate my rights, I'm gonna sue you. So we have a very litigious society. Lawyers are making a lot of money uh, because everyone's stepping in everyone's rights and, 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 and so it's, it's all about the contract. We want legal things, everything's gotta be binding. Whereas in the Bible, they don't think in those categories. They think in terms of covenant. Now, here's the difference between contracts and covenant. We confuse them because we don't have many covenants around anymore. The only one we have left is marriage. And sadly, that's being treated more and more as a contract. But here's the difference. For a contract, it's always about a legal deal between parties. Party A, party B, and the legal deal is between them. It doesn't involve anything about them personally. It's just a deal we're making. It's just business. It's just business. It's nothing personal. It's just business, yeah. Right. Covenant, however, is about a commitment involving the life of both parties. When people get married, they're not doing something between them. They're doing something in them. Their lives are being committed to each other. That's different than when you buy a car. You'll never see the salesman again, hopefully. Uh, you just give the money, and they give you the car. It happens between you. It doesn't involve you. It doesn't change you. Contracts never change you. They just take something from you so you can get something. But covenants always change you. In a contract, it's about acquiring something from something, someone. You want something from them. They stipulate what the price is or what the exchange is, and so it's a quid pro quo deal. It's a barter deal. I want that, you want this, boom, we make a trade. And it's legally binding because you got the contract. Whereas in a covenant, it's about an other-oriented relationship with someone. Con contracts are inherently self-centered. What's in it for me? And we're always looking to get the most for the least because that's what's best for us. That's how contracts work. And we got a legally binding because if they don't come through on their end, well, then we can, the law will force them to come through. But see, the covenant, it's not about what's in it for me any longer. It's rather, I will be me towards you. It's an other oriented thing, it's a commitment thing. It involves your very heart. Covenant. In a contract, it's all about protecting your self interest over and against the other party. That's why you have contracts. Contracts are predicated on mistrust. Since I don't trust your word, I don't want it in writing. Right? It's predicated on mistrust, and we don't trust anybody anymore. Everything's got to be a contract. But a covenant is about protecting the integrity of the relationship that binds together both parties. You have these vows, because they're commitments that, that are, are pledges to one another. And whereas the contract is predicated on mistrust, a covenant is predicated on trust. You are saying, I trust you to be faithful to this covenant, and I pledge to be faithful. That's the very nature of a, a, of a covenant. And it changes you, fundamentally changes you. Buying a car will not change you. Getting married better change you. <laughs> Anyone who's been married here for more than a week, you know you gotta change the way you think. You can no longer think me and I. You gotta think us and we. You gotta totally reframe things. You can't just do your own thing anymore. No, because you've entered into a covenant that changes your life. Now, in the Bible, they always speak in terms of covenant. That's the categories they work with. And the covenants are very, very important. They took this very seriously. I mentioned this last week. One of, the, one of the meanings that God infused into animal sacrifices, which the Israelites and everybody else had already been doing, so he's going to adopt this, this, this barbaric practice, but he's going to infuse it with a new meaning. And one of the, the main meanings he gave it is this. Let it be a reminder to you, you sacrifice an animal when you make a covenant. In fact, the word they used was cut a covenant because they would cut an animal in two. And they put the animal parts on, on, uh, 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 on different sides, and they'd walk between the animal parts as they exchanged their covenant vows. And what they were really saying is, if I break covenant, let it be to me what, as it is to this animal. Let me be ripped asunder. If my character turns out to be uh, uh, unworthy, I, I break covenant, well then the consequences of covenant breaking are death. And the ultimate truth that God was driving home is that to break covenant with the God of life is to choose death. And so they were always reminded of that, and therefore reminded of the need to repent and turn back to God. They took covenants very, very seriously, whether with God or with other people. Uh, and so when we think about salvation, we shouldn't think contract, something we get because we did something. We purchased it with a prayer, a confession, and, and a, a belief. No, it's something we enter into. It's like marriage. 
In fact, the main way the relationship of God and human beings is construed in the Bible is not surprisingly marriage. In the Old Testament, Yahweh is the, 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 the husband who's always trying to get Israel to be a faithful bride. And more often than that, she's not. So he's always trying to woo her back. He uses Hosea, the prophet, as an example of this. He's told, Hosea's told to go out and marry this prostitute and, and make her his wife. And after a while, she goes back to prostitution. And then Hosea has to go wandering throughout all the, the districts looking for his wife, uh, going to all the, the Johns of the time and asking, do you have my wife? Are you sleeping with my wife? Because he's illustrating how Yahweh felt when Israel was, 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 was committing adultery by going after other gods. But yeah, the, he is the, the groom in search of a bride. And then when Jesus shows up, he announces that he is the bridegroom in search of a bride. Uh, this is one of the clearest ways that Jesus says, I am the incarnation of Yahweh. Because every Jew of the time would know that that was Yahweh who was, who was the, the bridegroom in search of a bride. Jesus shows up and says, here I am. I've come to rescue my bride. I've come to win my bride's heart. And that's why the church throughout the, the New Testament is called the bride of Christ. All the people who are surrendered to him, have said yes to him, become the bride of Christ. And this is why in the book of Revelation, uh, heaven is depicted as a wedding feast. It's the consummation of this, this marriage that God has always been seeking. In fact, this is the goal of creation. God wanted a people, a people who he would pour his whole self out to and who would reciprocate by pouring their whole self back to him. And now the love between God and humanity would replicate the love of the triune God and therefore be glorified and expanded. And that's the point of everything. It's about a marriage, folks. So the good news, the good news about salvation is not that we purchase some kind of acquittal by a confession and a belief. No, the good news, folks, is that God wants a marriage-like covenantal relationship with us, where his whole self is poured into us and we are poured into him. The good news is not that we get off the hook in the afterlife because Jesus appeased the wrath of the Father, and we get in on this contract by praying something when we're four years old and confessing it with our mouth. No, the, the good news, folks, is that God has this incomprehensible, indescribable, unfathomable, beautiful love for this race of people who rejected him and put themselves under Satan's bondage and are destined for destruction without him. The good news is despite that, he's got this love for us. And so Jesus comes out of that love. The good news is that Jesus comes as the, the bridegroom who wants to rescue uh, his bride from her own self-imprisonment and from his arch enemy. And the good news is that Jesus comes then to open our eyes, to free us from the deception of the enemy so we can finally see the, the truth about how beautiful God is. He comes to reveal the heart of the Father. That's what he does on the cross. He says, here is what I'm really like. Get out of all those deceptive uh, ways of looking at me that the enemy's been strapping you with since Genesis 3. And the good news is that Jesus on the cross not only reveals the beautiful heart of the Father, but he reveals what we mean to the Father, what our worth is before the Father. The cross is God's way of saying, uh, you are worth this to me. I would cross an infinite distance and, and go to this extreme because I think you are worth it. I, I suffer the mockery and the spits and, and, and the, the whip on the back because I think you are worth it. Despite your sin and rejection and rebellion, you are worth it to me. I, I get the spikes in my, my wrists and spikes in my ankles and the spear in my side and the crown of thorns on my head because I think you are worth it. I suffered your condemnation. I experienced hell because I think you are worth it. There's nothing I could have done further than what I did because I think you are worth this to me. That means we have unsurpassable worth. And see, so what he's doing is here we are, a faithless bride committing adultery, but here he is pouring himself out saying, you mean this? You mean this to me? Despite that, I overlooked that. I want you back. He's wooing us with the beauty of his love revealed on Calvary. Folks, the good news is that the cross is God's marriage proposal, where he's saying, this is the true me. This is who I am to my very heart, and this is what you mean to me. Will you marry me? Will you marry me? Will you enter into covenant with me? Will you reciprocate and trust that I really am like this, that I will be faithful, and will you pledge yourself to be faithful to me? Folks, that is the good news. And the minute we surrender to that and say, I do, we're saved, but it's not a contract. Like, oh, no, I get the goods because I, I did the deed. No, in, in saying I do, it's like in a marriage. The, you don't purchase anything with those words. You just commit to something with those words. And when we uh, understand the Bible, when we read the Bible, we've got to think covenant. When it, it's, when it talks about belief and, and confession, uh, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, those are covenantal words. 
Those aren't contract words, do these deeds and you'll get something. No, these are committal words. Have faith in me, trust in me, be faithful to me. That's not an intellectual assent. In fact, James, in James 2, he says, faith without works is dead. That's not a real faith. That's not a covenantal faith. That's a contract kind of a faith. Oh, I believe this. Who cares what you believe? The devils believe, the demons believe all the truth in the world. Satan knows more theology than I'll ever know. He's got it all right. It just doesn't do him any good. Why? Because he doesn't commit to God on the basis of this. It's worthless. But when we read the Bible, think covenantal terms. And the moment we surrender, we're saved. But salvation is not this, this thing, a legal fiction in heaven or, or this legal deal in heaven or where God wears Jesus spectacles and he can't see reality correctly or, or this post-mortem fire insurance. No, folks, salvation is about the reality of God's wholeness here and now. That's why Jesus, everyone, he brought that salvation here and now. It's in, it's in the present. Yes, it has consequences for eternity, but it's right now about reality, and reality is always in the now. Uh, salvation is about being married to God and the wholeness of life that comes from that. That's why it's in three tenses. We have been married, and now we're learning how to be married, and someday it's going to be a consummated marriage. It's a process of transformation. Salvation is, is about God doing everything necessary to open up our eyes to receive the forgiveness that he's always been offering, and then to be incorporated into Christ Jesus, where everything that belongs to Jesus now belongs to us, just like all of our sin once belonged to him on the cross. This great exchange. And now we're infused with the life of God and the DNA of God and the spirit of God. And now we abide in him, as John says. But it's a reality thing. It's not a fictional thing, a contract thing. It's a reality thing. And because it's real, it changes us. It transforms us. And so at the present, we're in the process of being saved, saved from our lies, saved from our sins, saved from our bondage, saved from all the stuff that holds us back, that keeps us from being the radiant bride that God came to win. And the promise is that someday that process will be complete, and our character really will be perfectly compatible with the character of Jesus Christ, and we will see him as he is, for we shall be like him, and it will be a beautiful, wonderful, God-glorifying marriage of ecstasy that will last forever and ever and ever. And so with that hope, we earnestly go through the process of now making ourselves ready. This is what sanctification is all about. And it's not optional. This is, this is, it has to happen for us to be compatible uh, with, with, with the kingdom of God. We have been saved. It's all given to us by grace. And now by his love, he's transforming us. And someday that process will be complete. That's why, you know, the angel, when, when, when the angel was talking to Mary about the child that she was going to conceive, he says, you shall name him Jesus because he shall save my people from their sin. He didn't say, because he'll work out a deal whereby they'll save from the consequences of their sin. No, we're safe from our sin, which is why we're safe from the consequences of our sin, but we're safe from our sin. The road we're on changes, really changes, because we're talking about a real salvation from a real God who's got a real love for this real fallen people, and because of that, are experiencing real transformation when we really surrender to him. So folks, it's, it's about a covenant. I see, if you're in this covenant, you don't ask any of the kind of questions you ask when you're in a contract. Right. If you're in a marriage, you don't ask your wife or husband the question, how much can I get away with before you divorce me? <laughs> I want to get as close to the edge as possible. So you're still thinking, what's in it for me? I want to have as much fun as possible uh, you know, without losing the marriage. Uh, if I cheat on you once, will you divorce me? How about twice? Can I go for three? Um, oh, I can't go for any? Well, then uh, what is it to cheat? I mean, how close can I get to cheating? What if I, what if I you know, do this or that? You know, it, it, will you divorce me then? No! You don't, if, you're th if you're talking like that in your marriage, you've got a really sucky marriage. Uh, <laughs> that's not a marriage by God's standard. That's, you're in a contract and you're working, it, you're working the contract to get the best deal for you in a self-centered way. But if you're working at the contract, you're going to lose the joy of the covenant. In a covenant, in a marriage covenant, you ask entirely different questions. Uh, you ask questions like, how do we get rid of this obstacle that seems to come between us? Because you ask the question, how can we get closer together? How can we get inside of each other's skin a little more? How can we understand each other more? How can I begin to share your heart more? How can I be a better husband? How can I be a better wife? How can I serve you better? Those are the kind of questions you ask in a marriage. You're not, it's not about what's in it for me. It's not between us like a contract. It is us. And so you're moving towards the person. It's other-oriented. That's what our relationship with God is like, and that is salvation. Salvation is the wholeness of life that we're learning to yield to, the joy of God, the abundance of God, the fullness of God. We're learning to yield to that, and we're being transformed in the process. And so we live in the question, how can I get closer? How can I know him better? How can I surrender more of myself? Totally opposite the questions we ask in a, in a contract. I, I, 
I, it, it occurred to me, preaching this message last night, I hadn't thought of this before, but how it must break the heart of God. Utterly break the heart of God to be in love with the people who keep on treating you like a lawyer. Uh, and they just want to get the best deal out of you. Imagine being passionately in love with somebody. You love them and you want to, you, you want to share your heart with them and them to share your heart with you. But they can't, they're addicted to thinking in terms of a contract. And all they're, they're about is asking you questions about how much they can get away with or, or, or you know, how to keep the legal deal. What's in it for them? They keep treating you like a vending machine and, 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 and using you for their own self-interest when what you want is their heart. What you want is their heart. It would break your heart. Or if your kids didn't see you as a parent but just sort of as a legal necessity. Just keep from getting spanked or punished or something. It breaks your heart. What God wants is our hearts. What he wants is a bride. What he wants is to be married. And that whole thing is salvation. What we're rescued from and what we we're rescued for. And our whole life is a journey from one to the other. So I, the question I want us to end with is this. Are you relating to God on the basis of a contract or a marriage covenant? Uh, maybe you're new here and all you've known is the contract. That's true for most people, I think, in America. They, they think they got the deal. Um, but I'm telling you now, it's much more than that. He wants your heart. And it's always in the present. Does he have your heart now? It doesn't mean that we're perfectly walking with God and that we're being everything, but our life has a trajectory. We're, we're at least stumbling in this direction. <laughs> Because there's a reality that's there. We've got the DNA of the Father. And when we start acting like the truck driver, there's something in us that convicts us. It says, oh, I feel miserable doing this. And so we turn, we repent, and get back on the road. Here's the thing. I, I, what I'd like to do is end with, with uh, even if you're living in a, in a covenantal marriage with God, it can happen, as with human marriages, that you sort of backslide into a contract. People can be passionately in love and committed to each other when they get married. Ten years later, they're just kind of roommates living out a contract. Uh, you know, it's your turn to do the dishes. Well, it's your turn to take care of the kids. Well, and, and, and the, the roommates with a contract, we're working out deals, maybe with benefits, but the benefits often become part of the deals. <laughs> I'll do this if you'll do this. You know, it, 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 it's not marriage. Marriage is supposed to be this, this coming together. And so it's good, even in the covenant of marriage, to renew your vows. It really, you're kind of doing that every time you genuinely say, I love you. Um, but, but it's good to renew your vows. So I'd like us to re end by reciting a, a prayer that is a reciting of marriage vows to our heavenly bridegroom. And for some, this may be the first time that you're really genuinely surrendering, uh, and it's not a contract. For others, maybe this is a, a, a recommitment. And there may be some here, or some podcasters, who are in a state where you're not ready to, to surrender your life. And bless you, that's okay. You wouldn't marry a, a, a fellow human if, 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 until you were ready. And so I'm not asking you to marry Jesus until you're ready. I encourage you to get ready, but, but it, don't, so don't pray this if you can't pray it sincerely. But if you can't pray it sincerely, I'd like us to stand. Everyone stand. And just pray this, not as something wrote, but as a renewal of our vows to our heavenly bridegroom. Pray with me. Our gracious God and bridegroom, let me hear you. We confess that we have repeatedly broken covenant with you in thought, word, and deed. So we ask for your forgiveness and help in freeing us from our sin. We confess our faith that you are as beautiful as you reveal yourself on the cross and commit to always lay aside deceptive images of you that are contrary to this. We confess that in Christ, you made the greatest possible sacrifice to rescue us from our sin and from Satan's oppression and to bring us into a saving covenantal relationship with you. We confess that on the cross, you have extended your hand in marriage to us and by your empowering grace and indwelling spirit, we respond by declaring we do. By your empowering grace and indwelling spirit, we commit to turn from our self-centered, covenant-breaking ways and to cultivate the life of a faithful bride. By your empowering grace and indwelling spirit, we commit to pouring our whole self out for you just as you poured your whole self out for us. When we fall short, as we often do, we ask you to forgive us, to pick us up and protect us from discouragement and to continue to free us from our fallen ways. 
We thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit, for being a faithful groom, even when we have been an unfaithful bride. We thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit, for giving us the confidence that our process of salvation and transformation will someday be complete. We hope and joy, we look forward to the time when we shall perfectly dwell in your unending love as you perfectly dwell in ours, in the consummation of our beautiful marriage forever and ever. Amen. 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 Yes, praise God. That is our marriage, folks. Uh, there's a copy of those wedding vows, if you want, uh, out at the hub. Uh, some people have asked for those. Uh, I'd like to ask the prayer teams to come forward, and if you have any need that could use prayer, whether it's about this issue uh, or something else, if, if you've prayed this for the first time and surrendered to him, uh, are serious about living as a bride, I encourage you to come up here and tell these folks and, and, and look into how we can help you start to live that out. Um, but if you have any other need, uh, whatever, whatever it may be, come up here and pray with these folks. They would love to do that. I encourage us to go out now. I send us out, at, encouraging us to be a faithful bride that puts on display the beauty of our heavenly bridegroom. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Go forth, be the faithful bride.